there is a real stigma still surrounding post-traumatic stress disorder. And I don't know if that has to do with the words that I use to describe what's going on, post-traumatic stress. And the worst one, I think, is disorder. Now, technically, they were all correct. But I think when you hear disorder, do you want to be disordered? Do you want your brain to have a disorder? I don't think you do. And I think that's why there is a lot more stigma associated with it than a post-traumatic stress fracture, so to speak. And there are so many other guys that I know who are friends of mine who are still active, who are having these issues, and are, they're embarrassed. And it is embarrassing at first until you realize, you know, this is just like any other wound. I got my purple heart for a head injury and neck injury. That's what I got my purple heart for. But this injury is just as severe, if not worse, than that. And, and you don't want to go to the psychotherapist because you may be embarrassed or because you think it's a bunch of, you know, hocus pocus magic, voodoo almost. And, and maybe at a time it was, but that's not, that's not my experience here. When I first came back, I started acting in ways that were not healthy, to say the least. Bad behavior. Not the behavior of an Army Lieutenant Colonel, or one that would one, one would expect out of an Army Lieutenant Colonel. There was binge drinking. I was on the roof of a taxi cab, and I'm hanging on as he's driving off with me on his hood, and I start trying to smash his windshield with my fists screaming and yelling at him as if he's the enemy, you know? And so I, uh, I ended up, uh, uh, oh, a cop came by and blasted his siren. The guy slammed his brakes on. I go rolling off the hood uh, onto York Avenue. And they put me in cuffs and threw me in the back of the police car. And, I, and that's when I had a real flashback. And I thought for sure I'd been captured. I was in Iraq. I was in the back of a van, the dirty windows in the police vehicle, and the sun coming through, the blur, the real, and you can't quite make it out. I'm in handcuffs, I'm bound now, and I don't, I don't believe I'm in New York City. I believe I'm back in Iraq, and I believe that I was going to be killed. And basically, the next thing I remember is waking up on the sidewalk, sobbing and crying with these firefighters around me, and this captain who came up to me, and he recommended New York Presbyterian to me. And he said, this may help you. And it did. It really did. And I have to thank Dr. Sucre. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why I'm not out there getting in trouble. I'm not out there acting all crazy and acting like a fool. My, my outlook on the future is, is better. Um, there is a future. Number one, I'm going to be part of the future, and and I'm looking forward to it. Again, I don't mean to be so melodramatic, but I will be. But I couldn't see myself five years in the future. I couldn't see myself following through on any future plans, and I'm and I wasn't. I didn't really have suicidal ideation, but it certainly was something that was on my mind, as something to consider maybe in the future, and that might have been what my future had in store for me. And, that, and that's, that's one of the scary things about PTSD. And that's why it's like, this is serious business. Before I went to New York Presbyterian, <clears throat> I gave up on a lot of things. And, and, I, and I really felt I was just a fraction of the man that I was just a couple of years before that. And uh, I do feel a lot better about myself now. Um, but like I said before, it's, this, is, this takes work and it takes commitment and, and dedication and, the, and there's no magic pill that's going to get you through this. If I could talk to soldiers coming back, what would I say? I think it's, it's, it's really easy to just go down to the, to the bodega and pick up a six-pack of beer or a bottle of booze and drown yourself every night. 
That's, that's one of the easiest things you can do. It's also going to be the fastest road to the, to, the, to the grave. It really is. And maybe not for you, maybe for somebody else. And that's not fair. That just isn't fair. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to your family. It's not fair to your friends. It's not fair to society. There is a certain amount of responsibility we have for ourselves that, that we have to take on, that we took on as soldiers when we first joined. You've got to have the, the, the fortitude to go forward or make that phone call and just get in, and get in there because, you know, nobody's going to do it for you. You have to do it yourself. And I'm just, I'm just very lucky that I was able to do that and that I had somebody who referred, referred me to New York Presbyterian. Everybody thanks us, and that's great. I'm glad we get that, that thing. It feels good. But I have to thank all these other people who are involved in this, who are the ones who are going to make a difference in soldiers' lives, who, are gonna make a, who made a difference in my life a big difference in my life, and I thank them for that. Not everybody does this, you know. This is not easy work on them, and I know that. I have to thank all the medical people in the military, in the VA, and at New York Presbyterian who dedicate themselves to uh, helping us out.